So they will chat about it, but you should have two different sour Reuben sauerkraut looking things on your plate. So the one that has cabbage in it is the sour sauerkraut. And then they will tell you about sour Reuben. All right. So um, obviously we did sour Reuben. Hope you guys enjoy it. So what you need for this is you need some sort of glass vessel that's like cleaned out in order to do the fermentation. So we just use mason jars, which I think is what everybody used. Um, you'll also need one to two pounds of turnips and or rutabagas. We used both in that one actually. And then you can add some other um, vegetables. So we put carrots, onions in it. Um, but there's a ton, tons of different stuff you can add to it and then salt. So the process for this is awesome. If you're looking for a really good arm workout, definitely make some sour rutabagas because you will not only be chopping up some rutabagas, which are about yay big, um, but also grating the turnips, the rutabagas, the onions. We threw some carrots in there. Also mix them with pepper. And as we were grating that up, we added salt a little bit at a time and was essentially squeezing all the juices of those vegetables together to, uh, to make that fermentation yumminess and put it into the jar. So after we grated everything up, packed it into the jars, we stuck the jars with the pickle pipes on top and fermented that. It can be anywhere from three days to weeks or months, but our time frame was around two weeks. And um, what Katie said about the water, so the reason we actually didn't add any extra water in like you maybe would for pickles, or for pickled cucumbers, excuse me, um, Whenever you're squeezing uh, all the vegetables, the water kind of fills up the rest of the container. So that's why we didn't have to add any extra. Okay, so um, a little bit about the fermentation that's occurring. So the reason we added salt was to prevent the harmful bacteria from growing in those conditions because we only wanted the anaerob anaerobic lactobacillus um, bacteria that's actually going to do the fermentation to power the vegetables. And so what they were fermenting was all the vegetables we put in, this, in there. So the rutabaga, the turnips, the carrots, and the onions, which we got sour root there for everybody, so. Little mean for you. <laughs> Great, so why do we need to keep the vegetables submerged? Essentially what happens if those veggies left out at room temperature in the open air they're gonna get rotten. They're gonna grow that nasty bacteria that we don't want. So to prevent that, we had a jar with a ring on it and that was essentially to compact all of the turnips and the vegetables to keep them submerged in that liquid. With the fermentation, as we let it go longer and longer, the taste, as you will probably see with, your, with the sample you have on your plates, it would get more tangy as that lactobacillus worked through the vegetables and through the liquid that was submerging them and those sugars in the vegetables were getting converted to lactic acid with the lactobacillus so that's what helps with that tangy flavor and then why we picked this fermentation so the pickles were so rudely stolen from us after the cocoot uh, was completed so we were left with sour reuben essentially it was a new food journey so why not so we, we picked sour reuben um, and tried to produce a palatable substance for you. All right, any questions? No? All right, we have a, one final slide that I'm just gonna leave here as we walk away, so <laughs> feel free to read it. Very nice. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's really... There's like a whole, a whole like site for it. I mean, there's like coffee mugs and everything. It's pretty incredible. So, let me tell you what's on your plate. Today's all about preservation. So you have the sauerkraut and sour Reuben. The sauerkraut is the one with more cabbage. Um, and the sour Reuben is a little more orangey. So those are your two fermentation projects. And then I've got some candied roots there as well. Candied roots. So I figured I would do something a little unusual. Instead of candying something already sweet, I will candy something definitely not sweet. So this long kind of bumpy white one, that's horseradish. That is the horseradish root. 
And the bright orange one is carrot. And then there's another one that's a mild orange. That is daikon. So daikon is this, it's in the Rikula radish family. It's long. It usually comes from East Asia. Big, thick around. And I added some cayenne pepper to just to give it a little something different. Because daikon, after cooking it, can be on the mild side. So what do you think of them? Edible? That's like weird. Uh, different. So we went for different this time. <laughs> Give you some a taste of something you probably wouldn't have before. You know, I didn't mention this in the other class. The candied horseradish, that was that's a recipe from the Middle Ages because they used to eat that thinking it would keep away the bubonic plague. It does not keep away the bubonic plague. That will still kill you. But uh, they actually have a recipe from that era, and I found it on some weird YouTube channel where they make all this old stuff. Okay, so here's what we're covering today. We are going to describe why food preservation was invented. Uh, you should be able to compare drying, fermenting, canning, freezing, and how they all prevent food spoilage. And then uh, we'll look at a couple recipes, like the root recipes and the jam recipe, and we'll talk about all the different factors going into there that prevents food spoilage. Uh, Major Almond is making strawberry jam right now. Half of that will be served as jam and the rest will be actually put in the dehydrator and next class we'll do some fruit leather with it. So we got all sorts of little things going on. Why did people start fermenting? Well, you can imagine thousands of years ago people would find this great, you know, bush full of berries, and you had two choices. You really either, you ate all the berries at once, or in that two week span, that that bush had those berries, or you let them go to waste. Um, if you killed like a big mammoth, you either had to eat all the meat right away, or it went to waste. So, quickly people realized that this was not an efficient use of time, they were hunters and gatherers still. They didn't have farms next to them, so they couldn't just walk out of their house and go get some food. They actually had to go work really hard for it. And so the invention of preservation allows them to, when things are bountiful, go and harvest them and then save them for the later times in the year when things are not bountiful. It also allows us to spread out to new places where food might not be available year round. Now you see humans at you know, every corner of the globe because um, like even in those freezing cold areas where there's no food for long stretches of time, you can still preserve food and have something to eat during those, uh, the blight times. Obviously freed up people to go out and do a lot of other things. You see a theme with food, with the farming and preservation as our food technology improves. It allowed us to have more time to go do cool things that were not just hunting and gathering or farming and things like that. We actually could go invent technology and do arts and all these important things. So that's where we got the idea of food preservation. Allowed us to do a lot more stuff. What do you think the first preservation technique was? Salt. Drying. I, I think it's drying. Salt would be good, but you have to go find salt. So even before they found salt, you had the sun. It was beating down, drying things out. And all you had to do was go toss your fruits, vegetables, or meats out in the sun. So I'm going to focus on fruits and vegetables here. I will actually cover some meat preservation during the meat preservation lecture. So generally, you know, like thousands of years ago, they came up with drying. We have evidence from it. Probably the first one invented. All you gotta do is generally cut your, your fruit fairly thin or your vegetables thin, and you let the sun do the rest of the work. You cut them thin because you wanna make sure that they dehydrate evenly and that the center dehydrates fast enough so the center doesn't start rotting or getting invaded by something after the, uh, the outside has. How does this work? How does this actually allow food to last longer? What does it do? We've talked about this. And it's the last bullet on the slide. Yeah, it deprives <laughs> organisms of water. Good reading. So what we're able to do is, you need water, I need water. 
everything on earth pretty much needs a lot of water to continue its life functions. Um, and if we remove that water by drying it, then the bacteria or the mold or whatever wants to get in there has no water to work with. And so it can't do anything. So there's a cool um, play on this where instead of taking all the water out, you can just make it unavailable. And Major Almond actually mentioned this the other day, that sugar binds to water and just makes it unavailable for the organism. So yeah, it's there, but the organism goes to, to reach for it and the water's already, already holding on to it. That's what we're doing in candying. So like the carrot and the daikon are still flexible. They're not like dried. And there's still a, a decent amount of moisture in there. But bacteria, mold, they can't get to it. They can't really do anything with it. Oh, so honey. Honey has an extremely low water content and lots and lots of sugar. They have found honey that is thousands of years old and it's still perfectly good. Just was buried in like some vessel. They just found some of that a couple years ago. That's why bees actually turn nectar into honey because then it lasts them throughout the winter. So they actually came up with this preservation before we did. So pickling is our next topic. Now you guys are kind of pros at the fermentation, or you should be because you're coming up and presenting how it works to us. What we need for good pickling is we need to get an acidity down to like a pH of 4.6. Kind of the magic number. Below 4.6, we're really favoring the lactobacillus growth. And a it's basically, it's thriving in there, and most other bacterias and molds can't really do very well at that low pH. So not only is it, is it thriving, and the other ones can't do so well, but because the lactobacillus is thriving, it's eating up all the sugars, and so it's, an in, it's kind of a harsh environment for other bacteria, and their food is rapidly being taken away from them. So, Yes, tons of bacteria is in these like fermented products, but it's all happy bacteria, stuff that doesn't hurt us, we work well with. And all the, all the bad stuff is just competed out. There's a couple ways to get your acidity down to that level. The way you guys are pretty much doing it is you're adding salt and water, and you could just probably do this with just water and just give the lactobacillus a place to thrive and then it produces acid, lactic acid, and that will just lower the pH. That takes a few weeks. That's why our fermentation products are taking some time to get ready. It creates that own natural lactobacillus acid, the lactic acids, brings your pH down, and now it's got that environment that is perfect for its own organism, the lacto, and prevents anything else from getting a foothold. The other way is we just add some acid. I mean, we can just put vinegar in there. Vinegar is acetic acid. You put cider vinegar or white vinegar. It just dose it down to a low pH without adding any other bacteria. There will be some lacto in there that will do okay, um, but you've just manually brought it down to a low pH, so you don't have to do much waiting. It actually could be ready in a day or two. So that's a quick pickle. There is a difference, though, in how you generally store them and how long they last. The quick pickles are considered refrigerator pickles because you don't let them sit out the way we've let your fermentation products sit out. Why? Well, they have one shield, they have one bit of protection, the 4.6 or lower pH, but they don't already have a thriving colony of lacto in there to prevent that, pre present that other shield preventing other bacteria. I was always told that if you have a cramp, you're supposed to drink pickle juice. It, one, is that true? And two, does it have anything to do with the lactobacillus? You know, I could think of potassium and like calcium, certain ions for cramps. But I can't imagine that the pickle juice has those in high quantities. Do you know, Major Allman? Well, so the lactobacillus won't do anything. Yeah, I don't think the bacteria just, will. So it'll survive going through your stomach and into your intestines, but like the sheer amount of time it would take for it to get all the way down and then to your cramp, like if you had done nothing, it probably would have worked just as fast, yeah. right? 
But then, yeah, I think it's probably a calcium ion type thing. Yeah, There's so a lot, a lot of times cramps, depending on what kind of cramp, are they like a leg cramp or side cramp? Because the leg cramps are often caused by a ion imbalance, um, which is just throwing your muscles off and your nerves off. Uh, that can be solved by increasing your potassium and calcium intake. That's why they also say, like, eat a lot of bananas if you're having problems with cramps. Okay. And sorry, what about the side cramps? Like if you eat and then you run? So the side, well, side cramps are usually caused by um, like an impedance in your blood flow going through, I think it's like your liver. And I, I think just staying well hydrated and practicing running a lot is what gets rid of those. I think you just got to build up your cardiovascular system. And unfortunately, like a lot of things, there's no quick fix for these. But if you'll notice, so sometimes you'll see marathons will just like eat straight salt packets. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lot of that salt from... Yeah, because what's happening during a marathon, you're sweating out mm -hmm. a ton of salt. And you're just drinking in water. And if you just drink in water, you lose all the salt. You Then you can get those cramps really bad because it's that ion imbalance. So chug some salt. <laughs> it's not necessarily harmful. You just got to keep it all in balance. All right, oil packing. You probably haven't really thought of oil as a preservation technique. Uh, it's not one we use a lot. It was used in old times a lot more. Um, you could take a vegetable or fruit and you could just put it at the bottom of a vat of oil and it will do a couple things. It'll prevent more bacteria from really getting down into it, but what it really helps with is it prevents oxygen from getting to it. The problem with oxygen is it likes to go around and gobble up other molecules and break them. One of the big things it breaks are other fat molecules. Uh, so has anyone had flour go rancid is what we call it? So it starts to smell a little off or tastes off if you cook with it. It doesn't taste very good once you cook with it. Flour has natural fats in it from the wheat. And those fats, when exposed to oxygen, can break down into other fats that just don't taste good. Not harmful to you, but it doesn't taste great. This, this oil will prevent any of those fats from, or any of those oxygens from getting through the fat and oxidizing your vegetables and your fruits. Can bacteria still grow at the bottom of that vat of oil, given a food source like vegetables? Yes. Yes, I see you nodding your heads. That's pure anaerobic, um, and they will spoil your food really quickly. So if you want to f not just prevent oxidation, but you want to actually preserve the food for the long haul, what you'll do is you'll cook it in that oil first. That will kill everything that's down there, and then the oil will kind of provide a barrier that prevents other things from getting down to your food. So there's just no bacteria on your food to, to rot it. Sometimes you can do this with like saturated fats, which of course when they cool, they'll, they'll be a nice hard layer and that makes it even more impenetrable to other things. And that's like a technique for confit, which we'll talk about when we talk about meat. So this brings us to Major Almond's favorite, canning. Specifically canned beans in this case. But canning is, as we learned in the Kahoot, invented in 1809. And is this, this is all American, right? Or is this invented in other country? Other country. Yeah. Other country, otherwise why would I say anything? <laughs> and can you imagine what country it was? Where is like the finest food, finest food French. created? France. Yeah, this is a French technique. For preserving food. They wanted to preserve it so they could go out to the battlefields and things like that for longer periods of time. How does it work? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. You, you shove your food into a can, you heat the thing up to sterilize it, and then you seal the can. Okay, so you sterilize it, there's nothing living in there. You've sealed it so nothing living can get in there. Well, that'll sit on your shelf for a long, long time. So, one of the big inventions in canning was this rolled over seal. You notice like every can out there, if it doesn't have a pull tab, your can opener fits it because they're all using this patented seal that makes it very uh, impenetrable to any kind of thing. 
Before that, they were doing it in glass jars and just like screw cap, and you just try to screw it down tightly. Didn't work as well. Now this is all automated. Um, the other interesting thing about cans, is, if you didn't know, is that the inside is usually lined with like a little bit of plastic or Teflon or, or something that prevents the food from touching the metal of the can. And this is because uh, you don't want the food picking up the metal ions. So you put something inert in between so it doesn't pick up any, any off flavors from the metal. Include, if you have something acidic, tomatoes are pretty acidic. Something acidic like that, if it was sitting on the shelf for a long time, could actually probably eat its way through the can pretty well after several years. So they prevent that by a, a thin coating in there. So one thing you've probably heard about canned food is that like, don't eat a bulging can of food. I, I heard that growing up. I don't know if it's still a thing that people talk about, but that is because of botulism. So botulism is a pretty hardy organism in its spore form. And back in the old days, when people would can the food, sometimes they wouldn't heat the food up high enough to kill that spore. And so that spore would then germinate and, and become the actual uh, botulism bacteria. It's not called that. Major Alman knows the actual name for the bacteria. That one. <laughs> that bacteria needs to grow in an anaerobic condition, which is perfect because you just gave it a sealed can to grow in. What can happen is if a couple of those spores evade the sterilization process and it's just not hot enough for them, they will start to grow and multiply as it sits on the shelf. And now you get that bulge of the can from gases and byproducts being produced. And you go and eat it, the bacteria doesn't really hurt you too much, but it produces a toxin that does. And that toxin will wreak havoc on you. So this still happens in the US. You see this is a CDC report, 2017, 182 cases. Interestingly enough, most of those are infants. There's a couple sources for infants. Either families are trying to can their own baby food and when you're canning at home, that's where you actually still see botulism. The factories, they've got this down, they heat things up super hot. At home, sometimes you don't really know what you're doing as well. The other thing that babies get it from is they put anything in their mouth. And so these spores will just be around on the ground and the kid will, kids don't care. They'll put anything in their mouth. They just want to see what it feels like and tastes like in their mouth. So there's dirts and sticks in their hands after they touch things. They'll get botulism in them that way. And that botulism can actually grow a little bit in their intestines. Now the good news is it's usually not that big of a deal. With modern medicine, we can actually cure it from these infants um, as long as we catch it. And parents are usually paying attention to their infants, so it works out. Brings us really to our last form, and this is one of the more recent forms that were, became widespread. We can do this at home, and we do it at home all the time. Back in the day, even a hundred years ago, people would pretty much have to bring you a block of ice for you to get any kind of refrigeration, so you couldn't do freezing. You had to either wait till like the middle of winter and you could go pack something in the, the local snow. So, freezing, just lowers the temperature, and as you lower temperature, generally enzymatic interactions and all slow down. And you don't really kill the bacteria when you freeze it too much. You can, you can damage it a little bit. But in general, what you're doing is you're just slowing its growth down to a very much a snail's pace. Very, very slow. Still alive in there, but it will take years and years and years to grow to anything substantial in the freezer. So most, most freezing now is done with these blast chillers. You'll see it like individually frozen or quick frozen, especially with fruit. That's because there's some problems with freezing. This method of preservation um, can damage fruit in some ways and can damage more, more sensitive things, or vegetables, fruit. What happens is that if you do freeze it slowly, the ice crystals have a long time to grow and they get pretty big. 
An ice crystal is like a little dagger. And what does that dagger cut through? Mouths. So. Cells. <laughs> Mouths too. So that the cells, like the cell walls break down and the food actually becomes mushy. So if you thaw out frozen strawberries or frozen berries, they're much mushier than what you would get fresh in the store. Yeah. Is that the same thing as freezer burn? Freezer burn's a little different. So freezer burn is when, and it comes on the outside of something usually, because that part like thawed out or got a little bit too much moisture. And it was after the initial freezing process, that part did get lots of crystallization in it, either from freeze thaw cycles or just a lot of humidity hitting it when it was frozen. And not harmful to you in any way. It just doesn't taste great and it doesn't feel great. So yes, they do. These daggers of ice do not feel great on your mouth either. And that's actually the principle involved in, if you've ever heard of using like liquid nitrogen to make ice cream, that's because you're super quickly freezing it and you make the tiniest little ice crystals. And those tiny ice crystals feel very smooth on your tongue instead of crunchy. So one advantage of freezing and canning is that you probably think of these as, oh, it destroys the food. It actually doesn't do anything nutritionally hardly anything nutritionally to the food. One advantage of it though, is that the grower can just follow their own timeline for the most part. Like you can pick this stuff when it's at its absolute peak of freshness and ripeness on the vine and freeze it and not have to worry about how long it's going to take to get to the store and into your home. And so you can actually, instead of picking it a little early, you just pick it right at the right time and freeze it down. So you can get stuff that's really fresh flavors, fresh flavored tomatoes and fresh flavored berries and stuff frozen and canned. And if you were to buy it in the market and it was especially near like the ends of the season, too early or too late in the season, it will never taste as good. So any question on any of these techniques? Yeah. Um, so my dad would use to make salsa and he canned it by like putting it in a pressure cooker. Yeah. Is, is that just make it really hot? Is yeah. So the way a pressure cooker works is that water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. Well, in a pressure cooker, you now add more pressure. So the water actually boils at a much higher level. So you can raise the water in there up to like 300 degrees or something. And it, it does, it kills things much faster. So let me show you the recipe that I used for these, these candied roots. So I used daikon, I used horseradish, and I used carrot. My carrot didn't look like that. I couldn't find a good picture of the carrot that I used, but it looks like a daikon where it's like this big around and this long. It, it came from the Asian market and they just grow different kinds of carrots over there. I think it's a big old carrot. So I cut everything into strips about the size you see there. How is that going to help the process? What is What good does cutting do? It increases the surface area. Increases the surface area, which allows us to do what? It'll lose the moisture faster. It'll lose moisture faster. We can get stuff inside it faster. Also, if I gave you a carrot as big as your plate and said, well, here's your candied carrot, it would be kind of inconvenient to eat. So there's a lot of advantages. <laughs> Next thing I did was I boiled it until it was soft. What is this doing? So it breaks them down and it breaks down, especially the cell walls. And yeah, it makes them, that softening is like the cell walls breaking down. And now it's more palatable. You can eat it easier. And also all these sugars and whatever else can get inside. So then I rinsed off the, the, the salt because I didn't want it to be too salty. Salt is a good flavor enhancer, even in, in sweet stuff. That's why we added it. It was just for the flavor. Uh, we can talk about salt and how it works more when we talk about flavors in a few lessons. So then I put two parts of sugar, one part of water. You'll be surprised how much sugar you can dissolve in water when you heat up the water. 
That's twice as much sugar as there is water. And it makes a good syrup. So I added it there. I boiled it until soft threads form. I'll tell you what that means in the candy lesson. But basically, I've boiled off most of the water in there. And then I'm left with just a thick sugary solution. And the rest of the water that's in there, maybe like a 15% water is left. All those water molecules are being held by the sugar and unavailable for bacterial or mold growth. Then you just pull it out of that, dry them out, and then I gave it to you. These things will sit on the shelf for, for ages and ages. Nothing can grow on them. There's not enough water. Major Alman, how is that jam doing? It's done? Well, we're going to give you some jam. This is store-bought bread. If you want gluten-free, we also have store-bought gluten-free bread. Um, and we're going to pass around jam. So I don't know, how thick did this one turn out? Um, not very. No. So when it's warm, it's going to be thinner. It will set up and get thicker as it cools. But we're actually not trying to make it super thick. Um, I'll get to what the thickness is caused by in a second. Can you guys think of what the four techniques, four methods we're using, four preservation methods we're using when we do, how do we make this? We took frozen berries, we added sugar, we added lemon juice, and then we heated it up a lot. So what, are the, what techniques are we using to preserve? Acid. Acid from the lemon juice. Frozen berries, so they were preserved already. Sugar, prevent anything from getting that water. And then what else? High heat. So we didn't, we're not actually going to can this. So we'll just keep this in the fridge. Well, actually, there won't be any left over. High heat, though, does kill any bacteria. And we could toss this in the fridge right afterwards. So we talked about the disadvantages of frozen foods. They get mushy. Why does that not matter here? Because we're mushing it up anyway, because we're going to break it down. If I was making a fresh berry tart, I would not use frozen berries. It would just be watery and mushy. But making a jam, you want it watery and mushy anyway, so it's perfect. Um, pectin. Anyone hear of pectin before? What does pectin do? Thickens it. Thickens it. So pectin is a polysaccharide. It's a long chain. It's not really as branched as the other ones. Like we talked about starches that are all branched and they tangle itself up. Pectin doesn't do that so much. Pectin, long chains that cross link to each other. So two molecules of pectin can cross link in the presence of acid and sugar, both of which we have here. This is also the reason you add a lot of sugar and lemon juice to jam, if you follow the recipe. One of the things we didn't do was add as much sugar as the recipe calls for. Because we wanted it to be more fruit forward, that means it probably will never gel quite as hard as your store-bought jam. But you'll get more fruit per bite. Anyone know where the commercial pectin comes from? It's present in cell walls a lot. And they actually pull it out of the peels of like lemons and oranges. And they peel it out of like the byproducts of apples after they've made cider and stuff out of them. Yeah, you probably could. I'll tell you, with marmalade, you're already putting the peel in there. Pectin is usually not a, an actual concern. One thing the seeds will give you, though, is a little bit of bitterness. They'll give you more bitterness. So I don't know what kind of, usually you use like a bitter orange for, for marmalade, and then you add sugar. And so you're trying to get this bitter and sweet balanced out. If you don't have a bitter orange and using a regular orange, the seeds can actually add some bitter for you. Oh. What's the difference between pectin and tapioca? Because I know my grandma would sometimes add tapioca to apple pie. Tapioca is a ground up starch from a root, from the tapioca plant. And pectin it comes from like cell walls. So tapioca is more like any of the other starches. Like we thicken things with cornstarch or flour, and it's this branched carbohydrate, and they all get tangled together and make it thick. That's what tapioca does. Okay. Pectin is similar, but it just cross links each molecule together. 
These are all different ways of actually thickening things, and they all work. They just work in different ways, and pectin can be clear at the end, which is why you use it for jams and jellies. If we put tapioca in that, it would be a really cloudy mixture. And that's why people prefer pectin. Also, most fruit just comes with pectin anyway. It's just part of the fruit. So you only actually have to add it if you want it thicker. So you buy some jam at the store, you can put that in your cupboard and it'll sit there for years or sit on the shelf at the store for years and be fine. But as soon as you open it, it tells you to put it in the fridge. Why do you do that? Oxidation. Oxidation is a good reason. And you get new microbes. When they actually can it, they're actually canning it. They're sterile in that environment. As soon as you open it, new microbes can come in. Has anyone ever had bacteria-filled jam or jelly before? I haven't either. I don't think bacteria can grow in there very well. I think that's too much sugar surrounding that bacteria for it to get anywhere. If something does grow on it, what do you think it might be? Mold. Mold, maybe because it's kind of growing above on the outside. And mold has some special capabilities. Fungi have special capabilities that a lot of bacteria don't. And they can like manipulate the environment around them. And they can change the level of water and sugar in there through their hyphae and break stuff down without like really submerging their, their whole bodies. So, Major Holman mentioned that Mitch's just keeps jam sitting out on your tables if you're allowed to eat there. They used to. They used yeah, to. Not anymore, but at least when I was here many moons ago, they just had those little squeeze bottles sitting yeah. out on yeah. the table. Yeah. So why isn't that yeah. a problem? Uh, they put preserves in the air out every time you use it. So part of it is just how it's shaped, right? So you're not taking a spoon or a knife and putting it in to the jam. You're actually squeezing it out. So the top part at the top there, like it still has not really been exposed to anything. But then you need to have a solution that a microbe can grow in, but what else do you need? Oxygen. How long do those bottles actually sit out on the tables? Not long. So those things are getting replaced all the time. Mm -hmm. So just because you may have an area that can have microbial growth, doesn't mean that you've given it enough time to do that. Because it's still hard for a fungus to one, get in, because you're squeezing it out all the time, and then if it gets in and manages to establish itself, it still takes time to do that because it still has a lot of sugar in it. So you just don't have to worry about it because you eat so much jam and jelly that it's just going through there. So we're also making fruit leather. Fruit leather, is, we're gonna take that jam, same one's gone around, and we're just going to dehydrate it more and get rid of more, more water. So that is, shelf stable for a long time. Why don't we have to refrigerate that one? And we had to for the jam? Like less water. Yeah, even less water. There's nothing there for the bacteria to grow on. Okay, and then the last one. What's the difference between jam, jelly, and preserves? Do you guys know? Jelly doesn't have seeds. Yeah, so jelly is just made out of the, f the juice of the fruit. Jam has seeds and maybe some skin. Preserves has fairly large chunks. The line between these will, will blur a little bit depending on the marketing that they want to use. Preserves sounds a little more homey. But jelly should only be the juice and it should be fairly clear. And then jam and preserves have chunks of fruit in it. So how is the strawberry jam? Tastes like strawberries? Yes. Perfect. You did a good job. Um, and the rest of it we're going to smear out on these, which is parchment paper, and dehydrate it in that dehydrator, which all it really does is it warms it up a little bit and blows, blows air across it. So it just dehydrates it. Anyone know what uh, parchment paper is made out of? Paper in what? That's wax paper. Close. Is it rice? No, it is typically silicone impregnated. So it's been sprayed and like impregnated with silicone which is just a non-stick, fairly inert thing that your food slides right off of. Wax paper is actually coated with wax. Separate thing. It used to be used for non-stick, but I would always use parchment paper now. It's kind of, wax paper is a little more old school. It's good for wrapping stuff in and preventing airflow into them. 
because the wax prevents air. So I think that's pretty much what we've got for you. You have anything else? Questions, concerns? Yeah. Jackie. How come um, a lot of food labels kind of hard, like they emphasize that there's no preservatives? I get the help. It's a, it's a, that's a marketing thing. There's a lot of people who don't want to eat preservatives. Um, either they're worried about them or they're worried about the, you know, potential unknowns. Uh, and so it's, it's just part of them setting themselves apart from other manufacturers who do use preservatives. If there's no preservatives, then they're using some of these natural techniques. Yeah, we could actually put chemicals in any of these and make them last much, much longer. Yeah, and part of that has to go back to like our very, like our second lesson. Yeah. Right, so preservatives have a really bad reputation. So salt and sugar, in a lot of cases, can do the same thing. They can remove that water so microbes don't have access to it. And then you can put that cool label on that says preservative free. So you can have artificial things that will do that. Generally, if you don't want it to taste salty or sugary, so you can have a very neutral tasting preservative, which is one advantage that preservatives have. Because, yeah, I could add sugar to everything, but now it tastes like sugar. So that may not always be the right answer. All right. Pleasure All right. as always. If you want more sour Reuben, sour kraut, oh, there's plenty. candied daikon, horseradish, there's a little horseradish left. We jam used up and jelly, the carrots.